right friends welcome back to editorial discussion this is the 17th february in the hindu we are going to deliberate on four issues today one is with regard to editorial that informs that index of industrial production contracted at the same time wholesale price index increased almost two and a half year high so this is one issue we are going to deliberate some terminology of economy second issue is tamil nadu politics and constitutional issues constitutional issues and parliamentary procedures there is one article on this we are going to deliberate something on this then third point is debate on state funding of elections state funding of elections whether it is desirable or not there are three views in today's newspaper because the hindu format was changed from today onwards so we are going to deliberate on state funding of elections third one is we are going to throw some light on enemy property act sorry enemy property ordinance right so these four issues we are going to deliberate in today's editorial discussion so the first issue is the bumps ahead this is with regard to hindu editorial the meaning of bumps ahead is the journey of india's economy as far as macro economics is concerned especially gdp growth then inflation then contracting iip all these aspects indicates that the journey will not be smooth in the coming financial year so before going ahead certain terminology is there and we would like to throw some light on the terminology here there is a mention about capital goods and consumer goods quite often in economics people talk about capital goods consumer goods capital goods are basically used for producing other goods for end use they are not directly used by the consumer you and i do not use capital goods capital goods means they are just like machinery in textile sector machinery in manufacturing sector this shirt is consumer good this shirt is consumer good whereas the machine which prepared this shirt is capital good this shirt is consumer good and the machinery which prepared this shirt is capital goods so in the economy quite often you come across capital goods and consumer goods so consumer goods are basically end products like soap laptop mobile table and there are two categories of consumer goods one is the durables the other one is non durables non durables are basically in the category of this soaps in the facial face face creams all these things are in the category of consumer non durables and consumer durables are just like air conditioners refrigerators they are consumer durables so in economy you should have clear distinction between these terms then look at consumer price index inflation and wholesale price index inflation today there is mention of wholesale price index inflation as well as consumer price index based inflation and consumer price index based inflation is measured at consumer level at consumer level i would like to tell you three four points about consumer price index inflation one is the base year for calculating consumer price index is quite recent base year is 2012 so it is recent second point is reserve bank of india takes consumer price index for inflation targeting there is inflation target of 4% plus or minus 2% set by central government to reserve bank of india's monetary policy committee so that is consumer price inflation then third point is it is released by central statistics office and it is also known as retail inflation so this is all about consumer price index inflation and for all practical purposes we consider consumer price index based inflation and the base year is 2045 for wholesale price index based inflation and it is quite distant and manufacturing has got more weightage and released by actually this sentence please ignore this sentence 
and here I am talking about CPI inflation and WPI inflation. In WPI inflation, the base year is 2004-5 and manufacturing has got more weightage in WPI and it is released by Office of the Economic Advisor, Ministry of Commerce and Industry. This is all about wholesale price index based inflation. And two, three things uh, when you look at economy, please do not forget this Office of the Economic Advisor, which is under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry, this releases index of 8 core industries and wholesale price index, wholesale price index and index of 8 core industries is released by the office of the economic advisor whereas the central statistics office under the ministry of statistics and program implementation releases consumer price index, IIP and GDP. So, this is important if you look at preliminary examination or any other examination and now in this WPI in wholesale price index, we are talking about this wholesale price index as well as this consumer price index. In addition to that, index of industrial production is there in the news item, index of industrial production contracted by 4 percent, 0.4 percent in December and here please do not forget in index of industrial production manufacturing constitutes 75 percent, electricity 10 percent, mining 14 percent. So, these weightages please do not forget and if you expand it further, this index of industrial production, this IIP has got 8 core industries one of them is electricity. This index of industrial production has got 8 core industries, one of them is electricity and others I have listed here, this electricity has got the highest weightage and this fertilizers has got the least weightage and this 8 core industries, whatever I have listed here, 8 core industries constitute 38 percent of IIP, please do not forget this index of industrial production constitutes manufacturing 75 percent, electricity 10 percent, mining 14 percent and if you elaborate further, this index of industrial production has got 8 core industries. Out of 8 core industries, weightage of this electricity is 10 percent, 10.32 percent, whereas weightage of fertilizers is 1.25 percent and these 8 put together constitute 38 percent of index of industrial production. So, the indices are released every month for index of industrial production or IIP which is released by central statistics office as well as the progress of these 8 core industries which are very important. So, this 8 core industries is released by office of the economic advisor. So, these things please do not forget and these 8 core industries constitute 38 percent of IIP. Then if you look at the GDP because today's article has got mention about GDP, GDP is measured in three ways please do not forget, value added, expenditure method, income method, value added method, expenditure method, income method. If you look at the expenditure method, if you look at the expenditure method, GDP has got four components, GDP has got four components. If you calculate it by expenditure method, first one is private consumption, our population is quite huge. So, private consumption, there is no dearth of private consumption, it is quite satisfactory. Second one is public investment or investment by government sector, public sector enterprises as well as government, their investments and that is uh, to some extent satisfactory, but the biggest worry nowadays in the country is private investment is not taking off private investment is not taking off, that is the biggest worry for GDP. At the same time, net exports, that means exports minus imports, always negative for our country because imports are more, exports are less. We are not able to push our exports also. So, these two things are in fact dragging the GDP down, whereas domestic consumption because of a huge population is pushing the economy ahead and to some extent this public investment or government investment and having learned these things as per the article, this IIP plummeted by 0.4 percent, 
then wholesale price index has risen by 5.25 percent WPI is raising it reached 5.25 percent which is the highest in two and a half years then food prices is not a problem at this moment but consumer prices of non food articles and fuel are major issues fuel means petroleum products petroleum products costs increased by almost 20 percent during the past 3 4 months and at present one barrel costs 55 dollars and it is expected to increase to 60 or 65 so government has to face the challenge of increase in petroleum products because 70 to 80 percent of petroleum products we are importing then in wholesale price index fuel and power raised a sharp 18 percent now finally future risks as per this article what are the future risks first one is core inflation is uh, sticky and will continue to be sticky what is core inflation core inflation means inflation if you take out out of the total inflation if you take out food as well as fuel then that is the core inflation food and fuel why they are taken out because of the reason food and fuel are taken out because they are highly volatile food and fuel are highly volatile so if they are taken out of total inflation then that is uh, core inflation so core inflation is uh, sticky and will continue to be sticky and another important aspect is oil prices raised from 45 to 55 dollars per barrel and they are expected to raise to 65 dollars and beyond and in that case government will face a real challenge and so far in fact last year government survived by increasing excise duties on petroleum products petroleum products costs in the global market reduced but government increased excise duties so government survived because of excise duties on petroleum products last year and now crude petroleum if it increases then government has to roll down those excise duties and it will have impact on the revenue element of the government so here there are two three risks in the near future so if the inflation increases in the near future that may reduce consumer spending and ultimately it may affect investment cycle and job creation if the consumer spending is reduced what will happen then it will have adverse effect on the gdp and ultimately job creation will be reduced already we are suffering because of automation and if consumer spending is also reduced then ultimately we will be suffering badly so that is the crux of this editorial look at second article this is with regard to tamil nadu i am not going into the political aspects but here there are three four issues raised in this article one pertaining to parliamentary practices and one pertaining to constitution so i am going to explain these things here tamil nadu issue and the constitution and parliamentary practices the first one is issue number 1 what is this issue this issue number 1 says that parliamentary practices and procedures speak only of motion of confidence or no confidence and some people are citing the precedence of two chief ministers at the same time going for the motion that is confidence motion but this article says issue number one here parliamentary practices talks about motion of confidence and motion of no confidence a person one person can only be the chief minister and he can ask for motion of confidence based on the voting of the legislators it can be confidence or no confidence the matter ends there then second issue the article is talking about the case of two chief ministers two chief ministers for two three days this occurred in 1998 famously known as jagadambika pal case of uttar pradesh in jagadambika pal case of uttar pradesh because of certain problems two chief ministers were there simultaneously what happened in 1998 jagadambika pal was sworn in as the chief minister and 
the previous state led by Kalyan Singh was dismissed. After dismissing Kalyan Singh, Jagadambika Pal was sworn in as the chief minister, but Kalyan Singh approached Allahabad High Court and Allahabad High Court reinstated Kalyan Singh government. You see Jagadambika Pal already there and Allahabad High Court reinstated Kalyan Singh government and subsequently the matter went to Supreme Court. Jagadambika Pal approached Supreme Court and Supreme Court decided to go for floor test by the two chief ministers. So, the two chief ministers went to floor test and subsequently Kalyan Singh won the floor test that is different story. So, two chief ministers case popularly known as Jagadambika Pal case and this should not be cited as precedent because Supreme Court might have taken this decision as per 140 to 1 of the constitution. And this constitutional provision is very important. This 140 to 1 of the constitution says that Supreme Court in the exercise of its jurisdiction may pass such a decree or make such order as is necessary for complete justice. This word is very important. So, in the name of complete justice, Supreme Court can take decision under article 140 to 1 of the constitution and in Jagadambika Pal case of 1998, Supreme Court might have taken the decision citing this 140 to 1 constitutional provision and normally orders passed under this article have no precedential value that should not have precedence. Right? The third issue is judicial review. As far as the legislative matters are concerned, normally courts are not interfering and courts judicial review power is evident when it looks at anti-defection. Basically, courts normally made inroads with regard to judicial review over disqualification of defecting members by the speakers. This 10th schedule of the constitution, this was included in 1985 as per 52nd amendment to the constitution if I am not wrong. So, as per 52nd amendment to the constitution, this 10th schedule was uh, instituted and here the speaker will act as a tribunal and based on the decisions of a speaker, then courts are interfering that is judicial review. So, judicial review normally is there in case of anti-defection in the legislative process. This is the third issue cited in this article and fourth issue is secret ballot. This some people are suggesting secret ballot for confidence, no confidence when there is a division in the political party and this article is against secret ballot because of the reason some minority party may support one faction of majority party and under those circumstances whether they got the support of two third of the party which has split may not be known. That is why it is suggesting open ballot not secret ballot. So, these are four issues from this article. Look at the next issue should elections be state funded? This is important aspect. There are two elements. There is a serious thought going on whether elections to be state funded, elections to be funded or political parties to be funded that is again to be decided. First immediate task is whether elections to be state funded or political parties to be state funded. State funded means government should bond the expenditure of whether the political parties or contesting candidates that means during the elections. So, this is the debate going on. So, let us look at what is the importance for this debate. This assumed significance because money power in elections is the biggest issue. Though limit is there, all of you are familiar with limit, now Uttar Pradesh elections are going on. The limit for expenditure by each candidate is rupees 28 lakh if I am not wrong. It depends on state to state in big states like Uttar Pradesh, the limit of expenditure by the candidate is rupees 28 lakh. 
but all of us are familiar that they spend 5 crores, 10 crores, from where this money is coming. So, black money is having its considerable stay in the election process in our country. And if you look at other important aspect, funding to political parties is also not transparent. Funding to political parties is the biggest issue. And please do not forget, 69 percent of the total income of all the political parties during the past 10 years, 69 percent of the total income of the political parties came from unknown sources or anonymous. Why it is anonymous? Because there is a clause up to rupees 20,000, the donations can be anonymous. There are two clauses, one is in Income Tax Act. The Income Tax Act, one clause says that political parties are exempted from keeping a record up to rupees 20,000 donations, up to rupees 20,000 donations by each and every person, political parties are not required to maintain record also. That is why 69 percent of the donations are anonymous to all the political parties put together for the past 10 years. If you look at this representation of the People Act 1951, this also gives legal protection and immunity for the opacity of political parties. That means, they need not disclose donations up to rupees 20,000. So, as to benefit political parties, these rules are framed and political parties are exempted from right to information act also. That is another important point to note. So, these protections are kept and basically political parties are working with too much opacity without transparency, right. So, now first view, there are three views, view, counter view and third view. We are going to deliberate few minutes on this. View by Yogendra Adav is to control black money in politics, to control black money in politics we should think of a floor level fund for every serious contender in electoral arena. He suggested that every candidate who get 1 percent of the valid votes polled, every candidate who gets 1 percent of the valid votes polled be reimbursed at rupees 100 per each vote secured by that candidate rupees 100 per each vote secured by that candidate and subsequently they may be divided equally between candidate and the political party. At the same time, there could also be a ceiling on the reimbursement up to certain limit, right. And the candidate should be allowed to adjust any permissible item of their election expenses against this amount. And as per the calculation of Yogendra Adav, if the funding of elections is through this manner, then the government expenditure comes to rupees 5000 crore. And this rupees 5000 crore is totally insignificant. When you look at the total government expenditure, every year it is around 21 lakh crores. Every year the government expenditure is rupees 21 lakh crores and this political parties funding or state funding of elections hardly 5000 crores of rupees which is totally insignificant that to once in 5 years, right. Then over a 5 year period rupees 5000 crore and as per this opinion it will increase internal democracy and reduce the clout of money bags. But even if of even after state funding also, definitely political parties will look at ways and means basically to get money through other sources. Then the second opinion by Congress leader is there should not be state funding of elections, because in a democracy the citizens has got every right to support certain cause, because political parties are standing for certain cause and every citizen should have the right to support political parties for furthering their cause and that is the essence of democracy as per the second opinion. So, counter view is Indian political parties are like standing armies that need continuous nourishment and they provide calling card to millions who otherwise may not have independent standing in the social and political, social and economic sphere. 
and election is a democratic participatory process and if a person is passionate about a candidate or about a political party for certain cause and is it isn't it logical to put money where his heart is his heart is for particular cause if he wanted to donate something for that particular cause then he should not be stopped because it will be then antithetical to democracy itself so, it will be subversion of democratic process. So, this state funding of elections is not a viable process as per this second opinion. And the third view, this third view says that this is by former chief election commissioner. He says that it is necessary to consider public funding of political parties and political parties can be funded post elections based on their actual performance. And here he is suggesting funding of political parties instead of elections, funding of political parties instead of elections. And he is also stating that it will come to rupees 5500 crore for each general election. And at the same time, here all the private donations must be totally banned and he is also suggesting party accounts must be subjected to audit by controller and auditor general. And at the same time, he is making another suggestion that if it, this is not acceptable, we should create a national election fund, create national election fund where all the corporates are expected to contribute and subsequently this can be distributed to the political parties. People whoever want to give their donations can give donation to the national election fund and subsequently this fund can be distributed to all the political parties. So, this is the suggestion and as per the opinion of uh, the former chief election commissioner in a study conducted in 180 countries, there are 71 nations which have the facility of state funds based on votes obtained. If it is acceptable in some countries, why can't in India? That is his opinion. So, there is a diverse opinion whether the elections should be state funded or not or whether the political parties are state funded or not. And there is third opinion like this established national election fund and distribute among the political parties. So, this is third article and fourth article, this is a story of a controversial ordinance. For a few minutes, we will spend on this before concluding today's uh, editorial discussion. Story of a controversial ordinance, this is with regard to enemy property ordinance. All of you are familiar with fifth time this particular ordinance was promulgated, this enemy property ordinance was promulgated for the fifth time and Supreme Court critically commented that it is criminal to pass an ordinance for five times, right. And under these circumstances, we are going to deliberate what is the exact meaning of enemy property, right. Please look into this. All of you are familiar with the wars, wars with China in 1962, then Pakistan 1965, 1971 and at that time some people migrated to China and Pakistan. At that time, some people migrated to China and Pakistan and property belonging to the nationals of these two countries. The people whoever migrated to China and Pakistan, they left a lot of property here. So, this property belonging to the nationals of these two countries was taken over by the union government. This property was taken over by the union government and subsequently enemy property act 1968 was passed and as per this enemy property act entire property this entire property of the nationals who fled our country was kept with custodian was kept with custodian custodian means it is the department or you can say it is the entity created by central government. So, it is kept indirectly with central government. So, custodian is an office instituted under the central government. So, this 1968 act regulates these enemy properties and lists the powers of the custodian, right. All is well. Then subsequently, what are various properties? Various properties 
most of these properties belongs to the nationals of Pakistan and there are around 9228 properties, there are 11,882 acres and value estimated to be rupees 1 lakh crore. So, this property is in the name of custodian or you can say with central government or government of India, a separate entity created by government of India, right. Then what is the contention? all is well, but what went wrong? Because this enemy property subsequently that person died and at the time of this wars, his son was Indian citizen. Subsequently, they fled, they fled to Pakistan or China. At the time of these wars, the enemy property in whose name this property was there and subsequently it went to custodian, their sons were there and they migrated to Pakistan. Now, their sons are claiming this property, their sons were claiming this property and some of the Pakistani nationals subsequently changed their nationality to other countries say United States of America. This enemy property, the owner died, his son was there, his son at that time was Indian national and subsequently his son migrated to United States of America. He became United States of America citizen and now he is claiming right over this property. The enemy act has not anticipated these type of difficulties at that time. The enemy property act has not anticipated these type of difficulties in those years and now they want to modify this act and accordingly they brought ordinance. The bill was passed in Lok Sabha, it was not passed in Rajya Sabha, there were some objections ultimately this was referred to select committee and now the biggest issue is five times ordinance was promulgated and where Supreme Court objected to it and this ordinance basically debars or it do not give right to the sons of the persons whoever were associated with enemy property in 1968. So, here what is the contention? If a son of a person whose property in India has been taken over after he migrated to Pakistan wanted it to be returned to him on the ground that he was citizen of India at that time and the property concerned was no more enemy property after his father's death. And the Supreme Court in 2005 ruled that custodian did not have any title to the property and only a trustee managing it. There is a difference between owner and a trustee. Owner is different, trustee is different. Owner means the person who is the right owner with the title and trustee means owner is different, trustee is different. Trustee is the person who is just maintaining those assets. Trustee is the person whoever is just maintaining the assets. So, here the Supreme Court stated that the custodian is maintaining these assets as trustee and hence the legal heads of owners of Indian enemy property, if they were Indian citizens at that time, they would get it back. That is the Supreme Court judgment. Subsequent to Supreme Court judgment, there were some claimants from Pakistani land and now government came up with ordinances to modify that. So, the center's position is, center's position was it promulgated an ordinance so that the property worth thousands of crores would continue to be with the custodian and as the ordinance lapsed, it promulgated it number of times. The bill was passed in Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha sent it to select committee and this is the present position. Basically, government is opposing the declaration of not the government, some of the members of select committee are opposing the declaration of Indian legal heirs of enemies as enemies too. So, this is the present status. So, government wants to make it clear that their sons, if at all they change nationality also, they cannot have claim over the property. So, that is the government's position. I hope you understood this enemy property ordinance. And with this, let us conclude today's editorial discussion. We will meet on Monday at 11 am. Please do join for comprehension ability discussion at 12 o'clock. And for fourth week, fifth week, we uploaded why and how and news at a glance or facts and figures. 
and for sixth week, seventh week also we are going to upload by tomorrow and union budget we will upload this week and uh, the remaining things will go on as usual. Have a nice day. Thank you.